afternoon. Luxury. Luxury does not denote a material quality of the object owned. It denotes the quality of its possession. And with this thought taken from Jean-Paul Sartre's being and nothingness, I'd like to draw your attention to a peculiar cultural dissonance in our dealings with synthetic materials like plastics that we collect ever more consciously to recycle, extend their being, but also make strenuous efforts to make them degradable, biodegradable, no less, in order to have them disappear in nothingness. Now, this somewhat highfalutin uh, existentialist thought was tested when I joined a group of environmental grassroots activists and marine scientists who sailed on a small expedition along the coast of New South Wales to measure the level of uh, plastic pollution uh, in that area. And the person who challenged me most was uh, Tanya, a mum from Burley Head, who had very successfully initiated a campaign to use recycled textiles, sew them into reusable shopping bags, and get rid of plastic bags. And she would ask, OK, I think we can probably use biodegradable. But is biodegradable the same as renewable? Or should we go renewable? But if it's bio-based, what about the water that is used? One question after another, it was really difficult. <laughs> what do the Aussies do? Even if we're just recent immigrants, we go to the beach. Um, so do join me uh, for a small uh, jog along the beach. Roughly, if you look, there are uh, two people in the surf. We just walk along there and keep your eyes on the sand. Piece of plastic textile bottle cap, a straw, plastic bag, a lid, styrofoam, lasts for 100 years, a balloon, fishing tackle, another balloon, lots of fun on the beach, plastic. <laughs> so in, in that survey, we did in fact find pretty much what you find along most beaches, always worldwide. Bottle caps, plastic bags, balloons, textiles, and a lot of other stuff that's here under miscellaneous that we couldn't really identify. Now, I took that picture. <laughs> oh, I'm, I'm, I'm glad you like that, because then you are going to like this one even more. Because, uh, <laughs> uh, because I chose Kalbara Beach, because in 1937, um, Max Dupain took that iconic image, not of the naked man, of the sand, that pristine environment. That was Australia, and still for Europeans, that's Australia. And indeed, if you think away the plastic, it's still absolutely one of the nicest areas. But we do know, not from Kalbara Beach, but similar beaches that down to a depth of around two meters, we find more and more small, for the naked eye, no longer visible, degradation plastics, deg uh, uh, degradation particles from plastics that we have just seen with the naked eye. So we have only sampled a very small amount. And that is the reason why scientists are calling for plastics to be classified as hazardous material. And there is European legislation about that. And it affects an industry that in Europe alone uh, occupies at least one and a half million people. It's really a growth engine and a source of wealth. It's clear to me that, or I feel always, that plastics are potentially the smartest uh, innovation since pottery. It allows trade, it saves lives, we can carry goods, and we can deliver services. It's just unthinkable not to have plastics in our lives. And that's how recycling looks at the coal phase. These guys have to make decisions in what is recyclable and what not. I'm not sure whether you recognize all these things, but let's say the portion that has with good citizenship being collected there has to be sorted. Bioplastics, oxo biodegradable, because degradability is again only a word. 
non-renewable. They may or may not be biodegradable. They can be bio-based, so it could be bamboo, but don't get bamboozled. Bamboo has, a, <laughs> has, an, has an environmental impact too. Anyhow, it shouldn't go into the recycling step. Then you have clearly non-recyclables that they might find. Then you have microbiodegradable. That's probably the closest to something being compostable. But then compostable means degrading into entirely harmless material. But plastics are compounded materials. So is there anything one can do to have this Sisyphus task of sorting very complex materials? And the answer is yes. And there's nothing wrong with a little bit of nuclear physics on a Saturday afternoon. <laughs> as, you, as you remember, there are 98 uh, naturally occurring uh, elements and I think 20 synthetic elements. They're still uh, occasionally producing new ones. And these elements are either detected using a neutron source, and neutrons cause an event with the core of the atom, the nucleus, and then from prompt gamma you can determine the nature of the atom, or you use, as you probably know, a particle wave that you produce by an accelerator, such as the large accelerator, the Australian synchrotron in Melbourne, and you again bombard the material, and you tune your wavelength to the object of interest, and that would be the atom. It's, in essence, ultra-brilliant light, and the trick is that the wavelength matches the size of your object. So we are quite capable to measure all these elements. Now, you may or may not have come across another use of, of these isotopes, and that's if the isotope or the atom itself gives off energy by a small amount of radiation, you can use it for medical imaging. That's how I came into sort of the application of nuclear science and technology, because it allows you to detect processes at an absolutely staggering level of dilution. 10 to the minus 15, femtomolar. That's pouring one glass of wine into the whole volume of Sydney Harbour. And of course, if you do take a bottle, forget where you got it from, um, be careful. So, <laughs> the neat principle with this, what we call the tracer principle, is that it is scale-free in space. You can basically measure isotopic signatures in the universe right down to single cells. So the principle holds true. What you have seen as a medical application can equally be applied by measuring isotopic signatures in, uh, in the environment. Now, we treat plastics not as throwaway items, but really more like precious little stones that we cut into slivers, and then here in this case put into the far infrared beam line at the Australian synchrotron. And that's just sort of a snapshot, and these little uh, colored dots show you areas where the plastic had different chemical composition. So, plastics are not just one homogeneous material, we've just hit on a recycled plastic. So we wouldn't even completely know what is in these plastics. And again, does anyone sort of recognize what that could be? You see the undulated shape on the surface. That is a sliver of a bottle cap that has degraded uh, swimming in the oceans, and uh, uh, you see the discoloration. Again, if you cut cross-sectionally through the material, you see an incredible variety of chemical uh, compounds and their comp de decomposition stages. So it's really difficult to say what a plastic really is. Now, we were in this first study primarily interested in the atoms, in the elements uh, within the plastics, the trace elements. And you see in these lower uh, row of, of, of strips the plastics that we looked into. So there are two plastics that have a lot of bromine. That's a bit of a pointer that this plastic was possibly treated with a flame retardant. Flame retardants are very toxic, so there's a toxicity related to the product in which the bromine lies, uh, is uh, incorporated. There's two strips with copper. I remember this was green plastic, so it's probably the dye within the plastic. There are other plastics who have arsenic. You can see it's on the surface, so it may have absorbed the arsenic from the environment. And then there is 
plastic that has very high uh, concentrations of lead, and that is clearly a hazardous material. So to cut a long story short, plastics are a um, compositional mishmash. It's very difficult to ascertain the risk of the degradation process if you don't quite know what is in these plastics. And the important thing is, so they are not only a source of hazardous material that they give off, they are also a sink, because as they degrade, their surface increases more and more, and they are highly adsorbent. So if they are in environments that have small amounts uh, of toxins, they would ac uh, accumulate and, in fact, become a sink and, and then a highly toxic source. Now, there's one thing I didn't mention. The plastics that we have been studying weren't collected on the beach. That was done by a bird, namely the flesh-footed uh, shearwater bird. It's a migratory, pelagic, marine bird that migrates between the northern and the southern hemisphere and nests on Lord Howe Island. This is where the lead scientist, Jennifer Lavers from Monash University and the University of Tasmania, uh, collects stomach samples and feather samples from their chest. It's technical. I don't know how she uh, manages to simultaneously have the bird give up the content of their stomach and pluck a feather, but, <laughs> but it is a happy bird afterwards. So no birds, no birds have been harmed for that research. But the birds are being harmed by the stomach content, and that is a true sample, and it's not infrequent to find that about 10% of the bird's weight was made up by the stomach plastics. Now, you know your own weight, if you have something between 50 or 80 kilos, five to eight kilo of plastic in your stomach, and not a lot, and some birds actually die, so there's a real mechanical injury. Now, we were interested in seeing, are the elements that I've just shown in the plastics transferring into the feathers? And again, we put the feather into the brilliant light source of the Australian synchrotron. In the middle is bromine, sort of an unclear uh, a pattern. We, we don't know it, we don't understand it yet. But on the right, zinc. Now, that's not a toxic uh, metal at all. That's a metal that is, uh, after iron, probably the most important biological metal. But what we found out, there are 30 lines going the length of this feather. And these 30 lines are deposited one a day. And that gives an important piece of information, namely that whatever we measure in these feathers has been deposited over a growth period of 30 days. So it's a bit like tree rings are useful in climate research. These zinc rings are giving us information. What was the sampling period that tr when we might have had transfer of metals or other uh, isotope or other elements into the feather? Now, if you look at the right upper panel, you see the profile of what is in typically in plastics. This is a bird without stomach with a, basically an empty stomach, and that's a bird with a lot of plastic. And you can e easily see that there's vanadium, chromium, titanium in, in the bird feathers. Now, I'm not making a comment currently on whether the health of these birds is impaired by the concentrations of these heavy metals, but we do know that this species is under threat. It's not a superabundant species, but it's also not an entirely rare species. In fact, it just lies between these two extremes, and having small reductions in a population like that usually hints to a larger problem. Now, in my introduction, I did say that somehow we don't know how to perceive synthetic materials. And in the 1950s, Roland Barthes, uh, another French philosopher, you recognize this by being a chain smoker, <laughs> he came home from a trade exhibition, he said, plastic is the very idea of its infinite transformation. It is ubiquity made visible. It's less a thing than a trace of a movement. And I think with the recycling, he was cottoning on to something that at the time we didn't even know. He also noticed that we are treating plastics, despite their utility, as a disgraced material. And we do funny things with it. 
we produce, for example, the red-nosed soy fish. It kills, <laughs> it kills the creature that it imitates and carries in its stomach a land-based product made out of beans, and usually it's just sufficient not to be enough. So you always have... <laughs> So then, after half a year, you look in your fridge, can we still use them? Just leave them there. <laughs> now, as I've said, we don't value plastic despite its many superior qualities. And I'd like to draw your attention that we have in the past hallmarked, in particular, objects of daily use. Not precious objects, that's not necessary if they are in a museum, objects of daily use by hallmarking them. In fact, for certain metals, metal, uh, uh, silver, gold, and platinum, it is in fact uh, compulsory. Could we do the same for plastics? Yes, we have the whole elemental table. We could admix into the plastic an elemental signature if we wanted. In fact, if we added a little bit of gold, just sort of 10 milligram per ton of plastic, it would be eminently traceable using neutron activation. So we could say certain certified plastics have that small amount of gold, and then they are traceable. We know the source. Or we could just sort of put our marketing hat on, say maybe, as we know, it's not just the material value, maybe we up the material value and we include into the material itself the currently externalized costs costs that we don't pay for, let's say the environmental impact. We could put an incentive fraction in so that people actually keep the bottle, make it a keeper. Or we could come, whatever behavioral economist may come up with, we could just change the material into a durable material. So the whole degradability idea may not work for that. It may not work at all. Now, there is a serious issue to it. We are just ahead of a massive revolution in our manufacturing practices, and that's distributed additive manufacturing or 3D printing. So the use of plastics, particularly recycled plastics, is going to increase massively in all likelihood. And we already know what happens if a big polluter is replaced by many, many small polluters. You can see here the plume of really extreme pollution emanating from these mi agricultural micropolluters who burn all sorts of things. So small is not always beautiful, particularly if you cannot trace. Traceability is important to create accountability. And if you have no accountability, you can't achieve sustainability, you wouldn't even know what is the most uh, sustainable solution. So trace the atom, trace the product, understand its true life cycle, and then you can come close to a decision that may achieve sustainability. Thank you. <laughs>